The Origins and History of Consciousness was a book written by the analytical psychologist Eric Neumann. Published in 1949, the book was praised by Neumann's mentor, Carl Jung, as arriving at conclusions and insights which were among the most important to have ever been discovered in the field of analytical psychology, also called Jungian psychology. However, anybody who tries to read the book without a background in analytical psychology may find it difficult to approach, as Neumann's essay is loaded with obscure jargon and difficult phrasing. The goal of this video series is to break down this book in an approachable manner and make it more accessible to the average person. I should note right away that I am not a Jungian analyst, and so my interpretation of this book may contain the occasional mistake or misinterpretation, but hopefully you will find these videos enriching and informing. So what is this book about? The first idea we need to wrap our minds around is what is meant by the word consciousness. I have made one video describing how analytical psychology defines the term, and it is pretty different from the modern idea of consciousness. Consciousness in this sense is synonymous with knowingness. For example, if I say that you are now breathing consciously, your mind makes note of the fact that you are breathing. Consciousness is also referring to the formation of the ego. Your ego is your self-concept, the idea of yourself which you have in your head. Now as strange as it sounds, this ego consciousness is a culturally constructed illusion. Human mentality is unique because we are able to produce metaphorical ideas, and the idea of yourself is, in a sense, just a metaphor. If you are unfamiliar with the idea of consciousness as a metaphor, I recommend watching my video about the connection between consciousness and language. One of the central themes of this book is the formation of the ego within each person. Given that the ego isn't actually real, how does it arise in each person? The ego can best be described as a special relationship between internal archetypes that evolve with one another as the individual matures, or as Neumann writes, as organs of the psyche structure, the archetypes articulate with one another autonomously, like the physical organs, and determine the maturation of the personality in a manner analogous to the biological hormone components of the physical constitution. If you are unfamiliar with the concept of Jungian archetypes, I have made a video which describes this concept in detail, and an understanding of archetypes is important for understanding depth psychology. In early human societies, Human mentality is almost entirely structured by unconscious archetypes. Archetypes are transpersonal, meaning they exist in a more or less similar state in every person, and early human mentality, before the emergence of consciousness, is essentially archetypal. In the history of mankind, as in the development of the individual, there is an initial preponderance of transpersonal factors, and only in the course of development does the personal realm come into view and achieve independence. This means that before consciousness develops, human mentality is archetypal, or instinctual, similar to how one behaves when they are an infant. Consciousness first begins to emerge when the person recognizes their own existence, and this first occurs when several archetypes in the mind come into conflict with each other, resulting in a psychological transformation. Or as Neumann writes, Ego consciousness evolves by passing through a series of eternal images, and the ego, transformed in the passage, is constantly experiencing a new relation to the archetypes. We will get into the specific stages of this archetypal transformation in later videos, as this process is the main topic of this book, but I provide a generalized description of this process in this video. In The Origins and History of Consciousness, Eric Neumann shows how this process can be found in the mythologies of ancient cultures. As Carl Jung remarks in The Archetypes of the Collective Unconscious, Myths are first and foremost psychic phenomena that reveal the nature of the soul. It may seem at first that myths have nothing to do with psychology, but what we need to remember is that myths are a product of the human mind, and so we can gain an understanding of the mind by examining the themes and images present in mythology. The way we view myths in the modern world is considerably different from the way ancient people would have viewed their myths. Entire cultures are formed, with myths helping to unify them and solidify their collective values. The mythologies of early civilizations are significant for two reasons. First, myths contain insights into the psychology of ancient people. Since archetypes exist in the unconscious of every person, archetypal ideas and motifs appear in myths. As a result, the process of becoming more and more conscious can be observed in mythology. Myth-making can be viewed as a creative attempt by a person or culture 
to express their inner psychology in a format which then becomes accessible to consciousness in order to help them understand certain ideas and help other people to understand the world and themselves. The most fundamental example of this is the creation myth. If a society produces a creation myth, it means that they have become conscious of their own existence and have begun to wonder about their origins. It is weird to think that at one time, humans went about their days without wondering where they came from. But as consciousness developed, this problem became more and more perplexing, resulting in the creation story. The hero's myth is a secondary stage of the evolution of consciousness, where the ego asserts itself in the world, while evolving and integrating new information. Both types of myths actually symbolize the psychological processes which each of us experience throughout the course of our lives, and learning about myths allowed us to feel like we were participating in the grand design of the universe. Remember that producing myths and stories is a uniquely human behavior, and it is this ability to produce myths which allows consciousness to grow and expand. In this sense, myths are not really a scientific attempt to understand the universe, but they do have a deeper psychological significance. Primitive man is not much interested in objective explanations of the obvious, but he has an imperative need, or rather, his unconscious psyche has an irresistible urge, to assimilate all outer experiences to inner psychic events. It is not enough for the primitive to see the sun rise and set. This external observation must at the same time be a psychic happening. The sun in its course must represent the fate of a god or hero who, in the last analysis, dwells nowhere except in the soul of man. All mythologized processes of nature, such as summer and winter, the phases of the moon, the rainy seasons, and so forth, are in no sense allegories of these objective occurrences. Rather, they are symbolic expressions of the inner, unconscious drama of the psyche, which becomes accessible to man's consciousness by way of projection, that is, mirrored in the events of nature. Aspects of nature are commonly used as metaphors to help explain psychological problems. In later videos in this series, we will demonstrate how myths are actually allegories for psychological processes. The second reason why myths are so significant has to do with the progressive evolution of consciousness. As explained previously, consciousness can be described as a process of producing metaphors. A metaphor is when we relate something familiar to something unfamiliar to help us understand that unfamiliar thing. In the case of early humans, the most familiar ideas are the archetypes, since the human mind is structured by archetypes. The archetypes are the first reality encountered by a person, and so they are the most familiar ideas. Consciousness thus expands when these archetypes are projected in nature, producing metaphors which allows consciousness to expand. The sun may at first be understood as being similar to a universal father, and the earth as similar to a universal mother. Mythologies are filled with metaphorical meanings, which project internal psychological archetypes into a physical world, and humanity gains in consciousness through this process. Primitive tribal war is concerned with archetypes that have been modified in a special way. They are no longer contents of the unconscious, but have been changed into conscious formulae and taught according to tradition, generally in the form of esoteric teaching. This last is a typical means of expression for the transmission of collective contents originally derived from the unconscious. Because myths often pertain to elements of the collective unconscious, they seem relevant to everyone in a group, and so acquire a transcendental significance and also enable social cohesion and cooperation. Myths can be viewed as humanity's attempt to understand the world and to understand themselves. Many myths draw upon various aspects of nature to help build metaphors about our inner psychology. Water is commonly used as a metaphor for the unconscious, while light is used as a metaphor for consciousness. This projection has two effects. It allows us to become conscious of our own psychology, and it also allows us to become conscious of these elements of nature as they become metaphorically described by our internal psychology. Take for example the astronomer Johannes Kepler. As Anthony Stevens noted, Kepler believed that his delight in scientific discovery was due to the mental exercise of matching ideas or images already implanted in his mind by God with external events perceived through his senses. By describing our own psychology and myths, humans were able to gain an understanding of themselves and thereby become more and more conscious of themselves. In other words, the unconscious has become more and more conscious over time. Ideas that are particularly perplexing may be best explained using symbols. 
You can learn about the idea of a symbol in analytical psychology in this video. And this video will help familiarize you with many ideas in analytical psychology that appear in the origins and history of consciousness. But in short, symbols often use archetypes in the form of an image to help give form to obscure ideas, which humans have difficulty understanding. Abstract concepts like space, time, and morality are explained in terms of internal archetypes, as well as ideas in the natural world in order to help humankind understand these difficult ideas, and new ideas are best understood as symbols. The human mind is constantly producing symbols as an attempt to deal with psychological problems, and these symbols are most effective when they relate ideas and concepts that are already understood to something new and unfamiliar. One example of this is the Ouroboros, which in part represents eternity. In the modern world, such ideas are easily given to us, but for primitive humans it would have taken a long time to grasp such ideas, and myths are very helpful for the process of becoming conscious. Symbols also have a deeper meaning than what they merely depict. A mythological lion is not just an animal, but it also symbolizes an idea such as pride or kingship, and thus influences the metaphorical meaning of the symbol. One remarkable feature of human culture, which sets us apart from other species, is the fact that we can transmit these ideas to the following generation, who can then build upon these ideas in order to gain new insights. New myths contain the solution for new psychological problems, which arise as culture becomes more complex. One example of this is the way in which Christian myths are attempted resolutions for the problems produced by earlier Jewish myths. Creative evolution of ego consciousness means that, through a process stretching over thousands of years, the conscious system has absorbed more and more unconscious contents and progressively extended its frontier. The structure of modern consciousness rests on this integration, and at each period of its development, the ego has to absorb essential portions of the cultural past transmitted to it by the canon of values embodied in its own culture and system of education. The evolution of consciousness is thus both the collective affair as well as something pertaining to each of us at the individual level. It is important to note that not all myths contain the same archetypal meanings, nor do they reflect the same psychological processes. The differences between myths is the result of different cultures and different environments, but there is a surprising level of similarity between myths, indicating that myths are a product of the human psyche. We should note that this book is mostly concerned with consciousness as a mechanism to reveal the unconscious psyche and is less concerned with consciousness of the world, although that is involved to some extent. Furthermore, the book is more concerned with the phenomenology of consciousness as it arises from unconscious archetypes, and evolves throughout the course of life by changing its relationship to the archetypes, something that is revealed in world mythology. The significance of myths to early humans, again, comes from the fact that myths help to illuminate the unconscious psychology of humans, and thereby evolve consciousness. Neumann believed that an understanding of how consciousness has arisen in the history of mankind is imperative for psychological health, because according to him, the relation of the ego to the unconscious, and of the personal to the transpersonal, decides the fate not only of the individual, but of humanity. In part 2, we will look at the symbols and mythological ideas which attempt to describe the psychology of the unconscious mind and the state prior to consciousness.